Barack Obama, the historic journey to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Do you guys know where he got that fired up and ready to go? Does anybody know in this room? No? Okay. It uh, came from a lady out of Georgia. She was 96 years old. He was down there campaigning, and she said to him, are you fired up and ready to go? And he said, what? And she said, are you fired up and are you ready to go? And that's where that came from. So my name is Patricia Duncan, um, author of A Defining Moment, Barack Obama, The Historic Journey to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I'd like to thank you, Rosary, for having me here um, to tell my story about my journey with Barack Obama and with myself. Um, there's some inspiration to this. Um, I'd like to thank my family that's here, my good friends that are here. And I also would like to recognize a former president of the Denver chapter, NAACP, Rita Lewis. She is now a commissioner on the Civil Rights Commission. So let's give her a round of applause. So my journey. I am a native of Denver, Colorado. I am the youngest of three. You notice I didn't say baby. I'm the youngest of three. Um, I have an older brother. I have an older sister, which you will hear about later, and myself. I graduated from South High School, very proud, Rebels, um, in 74. Um, I was always the friendly, like to do things. My mom was a caterer. And I didn't like to cook now. We didn't like to do that. But we did like to plan parties and things like that. So my brother was a model for me. Um, he didn't meet any strangers. He was smart. He would talk to anyone. He would do anything that he wanted to do. So I modeled myself after him. But there was one thing I forgot. It's like how to finish a project. <laughs> so as we go on, um, I wanted to go to Morgan State a black college in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, my mother is from Oklahoma, a small town called Duncan. My dad was from Alliance, Nebraska, and then moved to Chicago. And so you can imagine, my father was a World War II vet, and he was very racist. He did not like white people. And please, no offense, but it was real. And my mom felt that you could not get a good education going to a black school. So therefore, she would not allow me to go to Smiley. She wouldn't allow me to go to East. So where did I go? I went to Grant. That's where my husband of 32 years went. Um, and from there, I thought she was going to let me come back to East High School. Wrong answer. I went to South High School. At the time when I went to South, they still had the Confederate flag. We are called the South High Rebels. They still had the Confederate flag on a little purple outhouse. But the, the outhouse was purple, but the flag was a Confederate flag. And so the seniors, I was a sophomore, the seniors did a sit-in and said, no more. We have black students at this school. No more. It has got to go. And so after you know, a few days of protest, well, a lot of days of protesting, they got rid of the Confederate flag. So um, I graduated, and I told my mom I wanted to go to Morgan State because I wanted to do accounting. I was very, very good in math. And my mother said, well, where's Morgan State? I said, oh, it's in Baltimore, Maryland. She said, well, isn't that east? I said, yeah, mom, that's east. And she said, how many white people go to that school? And I said, Hardly none. That's the good thing. Hardly none, Mom. It's an all-black school. And she said, you can't go. I said, why? And she said, you won't get a good education. And this is something that this bill, your dad is footing. So you won't get a good education. So I went to my dad, who was a very level-headed man. And he said, OK, maybe I'll have to agree with your mom. I don't know. What do you want to do? And I said, if I can't go to Morgan State, I don't want to go to college. And my dad said, that's up to you. And I said, OK. So I told my mom, I'm not going to college. I'm not going to see you. I'm not going to college. So I worked. 
So at, uh, I always wanted to be a flight attendant. And at the age of 20, I became a flight attendant for Braniff International Airways. And my good friend who was in my class is sitting here with me. <laughs> and we had the best time. But you know what kind of education I got? I got worldly education. I may not have a piece of paper, but I have smarts because I learned everybody's experience is not the same. And when people tell you something happened to them, that doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. We all have different experiences. So I flew from um, 1976 to 1982, and Brandon went bankrupt. And uh, so I wanted to go back. Um, they were getting ready to come back in, in 82, and my husband and I got together. And I decided not to go with Brandon. I thought, well, maybe I'll go with United. So I talked to my darling husband, who's a Denver, a captain of the Denver Fire Department. I said, babe, I can get back on. And he's like, well, no, hon, I really think you need to be at home with the kids. And, you know, they need you here because of my schedule and stuff. So he talked me out of it, which is a great thing because I have now been married 32 years to a wonderful husband. I love you. So, uh, so we got married and uh, I went on to do great things. I went on and I was assistant ticket manager for the Denver Nuggets. I worked for the Colorado Rockies. I did a lot of fun things. And let's go back to the Denver Nuggets. So this was in 1985. And they were doing a study because there were no blacks that worked in the NBA. Now we're not talking about players. We're talking about blacks working in the office. So they submitted my name and they said, I, you know, we have an assistant ticket manager that works in the office. They saw my picture. They said, she's not black. They're like, what do you mean she's not black? She's not black. Yes, yeah, she is black. What do you think she is? Well, she's not black. She may be Puerto Rican. She may be Mexican, but she's not black. So I was like, wow. You know, I just said, oh, it's OK. So I left there, and I got on with Federal Express. Well, in the meantime, my sister, the middle child, um, was Vicki Buckley. And she worked at the Secretary of State's office. She started there in 1974 as a part-time clerk. So she came to us. This is a now. I've left now the Rockies, and I'm now at FedEx. And she came home to the family. She said, Mom, Dad, Trish, my family called me Trish, I'm running for Secretary of State. We're like, what? She's quiet. She don't like people in her business. <laughs> All of the things that a politician has to air, that was not my sister. We're like, are you sure? Are you drunk? What? Really? And she's like, yes. But I'm running as a Republican. So my dad said, OK. My mom's like, oh, no, you ain't no Republican. You a Democrat. And she said, no, mom, I'm not. I am a Republican. So my dad said, OK, we're behind you. Whatever you need, we're there. So she did well until she came to the black community to ask for support. They didn't want to give her support. She could do the job because she'd been there 22 years. She had done all the work that the other secretaries of states was getting the credit for. But they didn't want to support her because she was a black, because she was a Republican. How many of you remember Edna Mosley? She was the first black city council for Aurora. My sister went to her and she said, I need your help. And she said, what's wrong? She said, I'm running for secretary of state, but I don't have the black vote. I don't have the black support. So Edna said, that is ridiculous. You can do the job. What difference does it make what party you're in? So thanks to Edna Mosley, we got the support of the black community. Well, my sister went on to win Secretary of State in 1994, and she did grand things. But when she would not be unethical, the Republican Party tried to, started treating her very bad. She saved this state $9 million, cut filing fees for businesses, and they couldn't understand. Now, she doesn't have a, she doesn't have a college education either. All she has is two years. 
They're like, That's, there's just no way this black woman could just save this state that much money. We're going to put you under an audit. They put her under an audit, a nine-month audit, and she came out in flying colors. So now they got the hands out. Nine million dollars? Oh. She's like, oh, no. I'll do with this money what I want to do with this money. So my, uh, my sister was really involved in children, especially runaway girls. So she gave most of the money to the child care and something else. Okay, so now we're coming up again to 1998. Now, because the media is be beating her up, the black people say, no, we're not going to support you. We figured you were like that. So we're not going to support you. Okay? So my sister was worried. And I said to her, John Q, John Q. Public is the one that puts you in office. So I'm going to bring out to this. My sister died in 1999. She was always one that would say, you know, you need to start your own business. And of course I didn't. Well, in 2001, I started my own business. So we're going to move real far ahead. So I got a camera, and I had a friend that I asked him to help me teach my photography. And he said yes, and he became my mentor. So he was, I would sit in my pictures, and he would say, no, you have too much ceiling, no, it's not going to work. I said, okay, this is not going to work. And he said, no, I'm not going to allow you to give up on you. So 13 years later, I am now still a grand photographer. And I can say that because of a defining moment. I came out with the book the first time in 2011. But it took me two years because I kept quitting and stopping, quitting and stopping. One day, I convinced an investor to believe in me and my dream. And he gave me the money. I never looked back. On August 15th of 2010, I told my mother I had completed my part of the book. And she said, Tricia, I am so proud of you. On August 23rd, she went home to glory. On March 30th, 2011, I came out with a defining moment. And what does that mean? That means I validated myself. I do not have to have someone tell me what I can and cannot do. I can tell myself what my sister always told me. If you work hard, you keep God first in your life, you will persevere. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you I have persevered. I have validated myself. And there is not nothing in this world that everyone in there can do. So we came out with the book. Um, it was nominated for NAACP Image Award in 2012. It, uh, I ended up selling it out. And now it is uh, in the Library of Congress. All right. So. Um, I had a friend that said, you know, you need to come out with the book again. And I said, no, I'm going to stay true to myself. I don't have to come out with the book again. I'm okay. She's like, what is it going to hurt? I said, no, it's not going to hurt anything. So she said, I said, if I can save the money, because I'm not going to ask anybody for money. If I can save the money, I'll come out with the book again. And guess what? This is the new A Defining Moment. <laughs> So the difference, um, if some of you have it, it's laid out totally different from the first one, totally different. And in this one, we added a chapter. It's called, In the Beginning, President Barack Obama. So now we have the state, his first State of the Union in its entirety, and we have his first speech as uh, Commander-in-Chief at the Air Force Academy in, this, in the book. So I have White House clearance, so you will see Air Force One, you will see him walking across the tarmac, and you will see him um, coming out of, waving out of Air Force One. So if you buy the book, which I hope each and every one of you will walk out of here, because it has all of his speeches in their entirety. Barack Obama takes you on his journey. Um, so the book is $20. You'll get this bag. And you'll get this bracelet. It says a defining moment. 
and it glows in the dark. So I just want to let you know that, that it does glow in the dark. And we also came out with a defining moment, USB. And I thought it would be nice. I really tried to put on the video from the president's um, remarks at the national NAACP, but I couldn't, but I do have his remarks in writing on your thumb drive if you do buy one and they're $10. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to my story. Um, and please, what I just told you about that formula, it can work for anybody. It really, really can. So thank you.